He is risen. He is risen indeed. This, or similar wording, is the traditional Easter greeting among Christians as he acknowledges the resurrection, the hope of our faith, uh, the pivotal point of our uh, salvation story as Jesus Christ died on the cross, was in the tomb for three days, and on Easter morning came out of the tomb. We'll be looking today at John the 20th chapter, a lesson entitled, I Have Seen, as we continue our look through the Gospel of John. Let's pray together. Father, I pray today that you would help us to understand the significance of the resurrection. May it refresh us anew as we seek to serve you and follow you. Guide the words that we say, the thoughts that we have. For I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jerry Phillips acknowledges in the Explore the Bible Leader Guide that the resurrection is probably one of the most controversial topics uh, that we have in history. Um, there will be those who question the resurrection. There always have been. But it's also true that these who question the resurrection probably are the ones who are questioning the idea of a divine creation and also the idea of a divine incarnation that God would actually become man and walk among men. Today, we're going to look at three individuals, three eyewitness accounts that speak to us about the resurrection, who tell us about the things that they see or that we can learn about the things that they saw. Our focus will be on one of these, and that is Mary Magdalene, of whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. Since her cleansing, she had faithfully followed the Lord. Uh, she was listed as one of those that was at the resurrection. Uh, she also was one of the women who followed Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus as they uh, prepared the body of Jesus and took it to lay it in the tomb. Uh, she knew where the tomb was because she had watched them lay the body in it. Today's lesson begins with her early morning discovery of an empty tomb. Uh, we, would, we see what needed to be examined as we look at John 20, the first 10 verses. He writes, On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciples, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out, headed for the tomb. The other two were running together, but the first disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, then also went in and saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. So here it is. It's early in the morning. Mary Magdalene has come to the tomb uh, to announce the body of Jesus. Again, this is a burial uh, tradition of the Jews. And I can imagine that she was up most of the night thinking about this and preparing for this. Uh, again, with the other women, uh, seeing what spices she had in her home, how much spices she had available, who could she borrow spices from if she needed to. And as the first light began to appear in the sky, the light that comes even before the sunrise, uh, they gathered together and began to go to the tomb. Now, it wasn't a long place, a long walk from where they were, so it was still dark when they got there. She uh, was going to there to anoint the body. Now, let's just take a brief side note here to uh, talk about the fact of John speaking about Mary Magdalene and the other scriptures uh, talk about uh, the other women that was being there. Uh, this is not a contradiction in the Bible, but it's, it's an understanding and really proof of the authenticity of the Bible of how different people 
see or remember the different events. Bob Bunn is a content editor for the Explore the Bible Sunday School Lessons for Adults is produced by Lifeway. And he says, I like to look at these individuals who are recording this with the analogy of being sports writers at a ball game. Now you can imagine that there are four sports writers in the news booth uh, at a ball game. Now one of those sports writers represents the paper from the hometown, where the home team is, where the home team has grown up, where all their parents and relatives and friends live. Sitting next to him is the sports writer from the uh, town of the visiting team. He knows that his paper is going to be read by the families of the members of that team uh, with their friends from those back home where they are. There's a third sports writer there, but he's not from either place. He's more of a, a regional reporter, perhaps working for some uh, national newspaper or, or some uh, paper that reaches out to several different things. He really doesn't have a dog in the fight, so to speak. He's not for the home team. He's not for the visiting team. And then there's a fourth uh, sports writer in the booth, and he represents the, the paper in the college or the uh, town where a professional team is who is scouting one of the players. Uh, they've got people there looking at an individual to see how well that individual plays and if that individual is a prospect for a scholarship or, or to be drafted. And so he is writing not for either team, but concentrating on this individual player and what's going on. Each of those sports writers is going to report on the same game, but knowing he has a different audience, he'll be speaking about different aspects of it, uh, referring to different things in that. And that's the way it is with the writers of our gospel, where one will write like Matthew to the Jews, one like Luke will be writing for the Gentiles. There'll be those who are just giving a general picture, perhaps like Mark. But then there's also those who have a specific a purpose in mind, a specific theme that they're looking at, like John, who was talking about people believing in him. That's what John is doing. And he is focusing in on Mary. Now, he doesn't deny that there are other women there. He doesn't deny the fact that uh, that these Mary and uh, and other women accompanied Mary Magdalene. In fact, he actually, in a sense, acknowledges them because when he reports what uh, Mary had to say uh, to the disciples in uh, the second verse, he says, we don't know. It's the first person plural. It doesn't say, I don't know. It says, we don't know. So here in Mary... Uh, the mother of Jesus, the other Mary, these, they were all going to see what happened. It is interesting that the first witnesses to the resurrection uh, were there. And being sent back to the disciples, these women became the first uh, missionaries reporting of what was going on. They go back, the Bible tells us that having seen the tomb that is there and seeing the linen cloths and all that is there, they go back and they report to the disciples. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. You know, this explanation that the body of Jesus was stolen uh, has been a popular one among the people of the world. And it even goes back here to the disciples at the first as they're trying to decide what is going on. The disciples want to see for themselves. Peter and John do. The Bible identifies it here as Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we understand that to be John. And John writing the gospel doesn't want to use his own name. and He just refers to himself that way. But these two men have trouble believing the report of the ladies. They have trouble believing. So they go to see for themselves. And the Bible tells us they ran. They were in a hurry to discover what was happening, uh, to 
find out for themselves what was going on. As they run, young John outdistances the older Peter. He runs ahead of him and arrives at the tomb first. And the Bible tells us that he stooped down to look in. You know, it's interesting how so many of the artists' portrayals of the tomb, uh, the the drawings by the artist, the paintings by the artist will show a, a full-sized door with a, often with someone standing in the door, an angel or, or the Lord himself, uh, perhaps uh, seen from the back as he is leaving the tomb and the, this artist's understanding of it. But we don't need to think of this as a door in the sense that it would be the door like we would have to our house or to the, a bedroom. It was a lower opening, a smaller opening. In fact, John had to stoop uh, to look into it. As he stooped and he was looking in, Peter catches up with him. And Peter doesn't stop. He just simply goes all the way in to look around. And once he enters, then John follows him in. And while they're both in the side there in this tomb, they see the empty space. Both men see the burial linens. Uh, that were there, the linens that were wrapping the body of Jesus, the napkin, uh, the smaller cloth that was placed over his head. The, these capture uh, the attention of the men. And, and this is really pro appropriate to understand and to see them there. They're proof of the resurrection. The Lord no longer needs uh, the burial cloths. His body is no longer dead. He doesn't need that wrapping that would be there, that wrapping that would hold the uh, spices on the body and protect the body as it decayed. Secondly, it, it answers the question of the grave robbers. Uh, the grave robbers certainly were not going to take time there in the tomb to unwrap the body. It would be easier to carry still wrapped. Uh, they would need it to be wrapped to bury it someplace else. Uh, to inter it someplace else. They certainly wouldn't want to take the time while the Roman soldiers are there uh, to unwrap the body. They would take it away from there in order to do that. So the presence of the burial cloths are, are very important to, to affirm the story or to uh, add credence to the story uh, that is there. The men return. Uh, they go back to the place where they were. But John sees Mary as staying there. As the men return filled with questions, Mary has questions of her own. We see in verse 11, he writes, John writes, But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they have taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they have put him. As we look at this passage of scripture here, we see that Mary has an encounter with Jesus that is separate from the encounters that the other women may have had, those that were on the spice detail, shall we say. Jesus and Mary have a conversation. Now, again, the timing of this is, is a little different here. Uh, in the other Gospels, uh, we kind of get the impression that Mary is there talking to the Lord while the other women are there. Uh, some see her waiting at the tomb uh, while the other women go back to talk to the disciples. John seems to indicate here that she returned with Peter Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. But when Peter and John uh, returned back to the disciples having made their discovery, Mary stayed at the tomb. Uh, it's sort of as though there was a flashback here that uh, the, Mary was there with all the other ladies and then uh, she comes to see this and stays. It doesn't really matter when this occurred. The important thing is, is that Jesus spoke to Mary privately. 
she had a private time with Jesus, and it was a time for questions and answers. And we can see Mary there as she is crying. Uh, the Lord means so much to her in, in her life. And she looks into the tomb there. Uh, perhaps she even enters at this time. And she sees the two angels. And the Bible tells us that one was sitting at the place of the head and one was at the place of the feet. But what we need to understand is that in most of these tombs, there was a, a bench or a ledge, uh, sometimes cut out of stone, uh, where the body of the deceased was laid. And the body would stay there, wrapped in the cloths. And without the embalming that we have today, that body would uh, decompose, as was the normal course of uh, nature, how God provided for the removal of the dead. Uh, it would decay and go away, and eventually uh, nothing would be left but the bones. And someone would take these bones and they would store them in a container, and place that container along the wall or perhaps in a niche in the wall, leaving the ledge now available for the next person in the family who passed away and needed a place to be interred. It was on this ledge, this shelf, this bench, this seating area uh, that the two angels sat. And they questioned Mary. Uh, they want to know why she's crying. And she explains that it's her belief, it's her understanding that someone has taken the body of Jesus. Uh, they have taken it and she doesn't know where it is and she wants to go and, and be there and be able to see it. And I think it's very interesting to note here how she refers to Jesus. She says, they've taken the body of my Lord. And in so doing this, she acknowledges two things. She is acknowledging his position. He is Lord. Uh, he is the one in charge. He is the, the ruler of the universe, of everything. He is Lord. But she also acknowledges that she has a personal relationship with Jesus. He's not just the Lord. He's her Lord. She says, my Lord. And that makes that understanding that this is a very close an intimate relationship, not physically intimate, but emotionally intimate. She cares for him. I remember one of the deans at the college I attended uh, always referred to Jesus as my Lord. Uh, whenever in the, the class discussion or a discussion at some other point in time or when he was preaching in chapel, uh, when he came to speak of Jesus, he referred to him as my Lord. What a beautiful reminder that is of how close the Lord can be to us, the relationship that he can have with us. As Jesus talks to Mary, he continues the uh, conversation that the angels had had and turns to her in order to commission her to do uh, what he calls her to do. Mary is there crying, and Jesus comes and he says to her, beginning in verse 14, Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, Why are you crying? Who is it that you are seeking? Supposing he was a gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. Here Mary is. She's concluded her conversation uh, with the angels, and she is simply there crying. Suddenly she is aware that somebody is standing there beside her, and she doesn't recognize them. Now, a lot of people question this, but they're looking at it from our 20th century uh, habits and customs. At this time where Mary Magdalene and Jesus were living, 
it, it was an oriental culture a lot of times we forget that Israel is in the Orient it's in Asia and it and you didn't look on the face of others unless you were an equal and so it would be the habit of the women to keep their eyes cast down uh, they would be taught to do this from a child and so here Mary is her eyes are cast down they're coated with the tears she's crying uh, in my mind I even see her perhaps kneeling on the ground as she's just uh, too emotionally uh, spent to stand and suddenly there's someone standing beside her and in addition to all of this she's literally not expecting to see Jesus uh, she, uh, she's not looking for him she thinks he is dead she thinks his body's been stolen and so here this man is and, and perhaps he's holding he's standing there the shawl over his head his face is in the dark He's simply standing there. The last time she saw Jesus, he was dead. She's not thinking about this man. Thinks perhaps, well, he's just the gardener. He's the one who takes care of this area. And she begins to question him. What does he do? He calls her name. And when he calls her name, when he says Mary, she knows immediately who he is. She responds immediately at the call of her name. You know, we all have a favorite term for the Lord. Hers is Rabboni, Aramaic for teacher. Now, I don't know what her term is. Uh, some love to refer to him as Christ. Some as Lord. Some as Master. Uh, we all have those different terms. We, we see them coming out in our prayer life. Uh, when we address Jesus, how do we address him? I told you about the dean who always said, my Lord. Her term, was, uh, this Mary's term was Rabboni. But she also, we see that she grabs him. Her response is not just to call his name or her name for him, but to grab him. And I think she's just hugging him so tightly uh, out of the relief that he's alive that is there. As a side note, it's amazing how we respond when our names are called, especially when uh, our full name is called. I know that when my mother said, Gregory Michael Thrower, uh, that I had better pay attention. I know that when my wife uh, would say, GM, uh, that something was coming. When Mary heard her name spoken, she knew something was coming. Jesus commissions her. He tells her not to keep hanging on to him, that he's not yet ascended to the Father. and Not that he was going to do this immediately, but it was just a furtherance of his uh, explanation to her. But he, he didn't want her just standing there with him. He needed her to go out. He had a task for her to do, a commission to go and tell. And this Mary faithfully does. She goes and tells. You know, the, the uh, Jesus appearing to, the, to a woman, that being the first time of this, and commissioning a woman to go and be the first witness to tell others, really adds to the veracity of this story. The account that the, the gospel writers give for in that day and age, if they were making this up, if this was uh, to be a story that they would tell others th that they had concocted, then they would have had a man be a, here in this part. You know, they say that uh, uh, fiction needs to be believable. This wouldn't be believable fiction. So we know it must be truth that is there. Mary goes and fulfills that task. He, she says very clearly, I have seen the Lord. And that's the message that we need to carry to people around. Before we leave this lesson, let me suggest that there are two concluding thoughts that we ought to carry with us. The first one is, is that John saw and John believed. Verse 8 tells us that when John entered the tomb, he believed. If you stop and think back on what John was trying to do with his gospel message, this is exactly what he wanted everybody else to do. John concludes 
the book of John by saying in chapter 20, verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John is not asking his readers to do anything he did not do. He believed. He wants them to believe also. And that includes us today as we read the gospel message. Friends, it is so important that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God who died on Calvary's cross for our sins. On Friday, he died paying the debt of sin, defeating the grave, defeating the power of sin over us. On Easter morning, he arose, defeating the power of death, living forever, living in the presence of the Lord God. John believed. We need to believe too. The second thing I want us to understand as we look at this passage of Scripture is that we need to look for proofs of the resurrection. We believe, and blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We didn't see the resurrection. We didn't see the empty tomb, but we believe. But we live in a world that wants proofs. As our, a part of our apologetic ministry, we need to understand, what proofs do you see here? What things can you look at as you, as you look, not just at John's account, but all of these accounts, what things do you see that add to the proof? The writers of the Leader's Guide suggest that there are at least seven proofs that you can find here that, that come to mind here. The first is the broken Roman seal. Uh, when the stone was rolled in place, uh, the seal was placed there uh, so that you would know if it had ever been moved. The fact that the seal was broken indicates that something took place. Uh, they say this is a sign. This is a proof, as is the stone rolled away itself. Uh, the fact that the stone is gone makes it, uh, shows us that this is something supernatural. The fact that the Roman soldiers are gone. You know, I, I like to see in, in my mind a little humor here. I see the Roman soldiers camping that night with their backs to the tomb. They're not interested in what may come out of the tomb. They're interested in someone coming to steal what's in the tomb. They know that Jesus is dead. I heard a minister say one time, Roman soldiers knew dead. They knew, recognized uh, what it meant to be dead. And they were not expecting anyone from the tomb to bother them. And there they were sitting, looking out at who may be coming up the path toward that when someone suddenly tapped them on the soldier, shoulder and said, pardon me, boys. And they stepped away and let Jesus walk forth. The soldiers were gone. The, the seal was broken. Uh, the stone was moved. The fact the tomb is empty is proof of the resurrection. The fifth thing that is mentioned in their list is the empty grave clothes. As we said before, the fact that these were left behind is indication that they were no longer needed by Jesus the fact that, that Christ appeared and spoke to people, particularly to Mary Magdalene. But we know that there were others to whom he spoke, up to 500 between the period of his resurrection and his ascension. And the fact that a woman's testimony was the first proof in a man's world. All of these things give us a sense of the veracity, the veracity of the resurrection. Jesus is alive. Jesus arose today. Today we celebrate the anniversary of that resurrection, the victory of Jesus Christ over death. Let's pray together. Father, I'm so thankful that Jesus arose from the dead, that he has victory over the grave and over death. Father, I'm thankful too that we can share in that victory, that there'll be a time when we will have a new body, that will be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And this that is perishable will put on the imperishable, and this that is mortal 
will put on immortality. Father, help us to live in that victory. And Father, help us to believe. I pray, Father, for those who do not yet believe, that they would come to understand this truth and would accept it with boldness choosing to follow you. As the pastors stand before us in the pulpits of across our land, may they proclaim clearly this message today. Jesus has risen. He's alive. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Next week, we're going to back up in the Gospel of John and pick up where we left off last week. We'll be looking at the 15th and 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, a lesson entitled, When the Spirit Comes. I look forward to being with you as we celebrate this continuing story of what Jesus Christ did for us.